So I'm a um, functional medicine doctor. So basically what I'm going to talk about, we are going to talk about today is mine is more a perspective of a primary care physician. So in the functional medicine world, we are called the super generalists. Whereas in India, sometimes the primary care physician is either a family doctor or even an internal medicine specialist. So today my perspective will be more from the point of view of what Number one, when should you look for parathyroid hyperparathyroidism? And next is when you find that, what are the things you can do from a primarily a primary care perspective? Because um, the important questions are, what are the things we should look for? And when is it uh, absolutely necessary to refer a patient to an endocrine surgeon? And as Dr. Mishra said, so Dr. Mishra, how many endocrine surgeons are there in India? Because I think it's a very rare breed. Uh, if we include our alumni and some other uh, departments, it will be around, say, uh, 30, 30 to 35 now. Wow. So 30, 35 in a country of 1.3 billion. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure, I hope some, you know, new upcoming doctors are listening to this. That's a major area. So moving on to, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the basics. So this is just an overview of what some of the things are that we're going to talk about today. Uh, basically, as Dr. Mishra, you mentioned that many of the endocrine glands are very small. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on the physiology because I'm focusing more on the clinical side. So the, uh, what I understand is the parathyroid glands are extremely small normally, right? They're about the size of a grain of rice, right? It's called, uh, you can uh, split bean size. <laughs> okay. And I have personally really never seen a parathyroid gland in my life, as I'm sure many of my colleagues have not seen either. So basically, uh, Dr. Mishra, will you just highlight very briefly what are the main functions, the chief ones being maintaining serum calcium and phosphorus levels and uh, highlight a little bit about parathyroid and vitamin D. And the third uh, area, I'm just going to mention a little bit. So uh, Dr. Mishra, over to you. Yeah, so the, the parathyroid hormone uh, is, uh, uh, is a very important hormone in the sense it controls uh, so many functions, uh, being a small gland, but it controls big organs like the entire bone, skeletal mass. It's controlled by, by the parathyroid hormone. Without a parathyroid hormone, I don't think you could have really have bones. So they help in mineralization of the bone in terms of the depositing calcium to get the calcium. It helps in absorption of the calcium. So starting from absorption of calcium from the new, new, uh, diet till it is depositing in the, in the bone, it has all the role. At the same time, it helps in both uh, even uh, degrading the bone side, bone, uh, depositing the bone, everything else. So you should understand the high dose of uh, PTAs can also cause degradation of the bone, that we call reserve from the bone. But at the same time, normal uh, parathyroid hormone requires for uh, skeletal uh, growth. And second thing is, it has a role in many other organs that indirectly, not directly, but indirectly. But the target organs are kidney and the bone. And vitamin D is another hormone. It is called vitamin, but peculiarly it is also called a hormone because vitamin D very crucial role especially vitamin D that you get in the diet is not active vitamin D. It has to convert to active vitamin D in, in the kidney. So 125 vitamin D3 has to become 25 vitamin D3. Then it come back and act uh, as, as a uh, agent to help in the absorption of the vitamin, uh, this thing, PTS. Uh, so PTS secretion, so PTS secretion. So the target organ is in parathyroid. So vitamin D, 25 hydroxy, vitamin D acts in the parathyroid. So it is PTH acts on the uh, intestine, whereas vitamin D, after it's getting active form in the kidney, goes back and acts on the parathyroid hormone. It, it's a kind of axis that go, goes around. So this is the only hormone, please remember, it's the only hormone, it doesn't depend on the master endocrine gland, that is the pituitary. Otherwise, the rest of all the hormones, they're controlled by the master, master gland in pituitary. But it has escaped. It doesn't care who is pituitary. So it acts in the bone, parathyroid, and the intestine. Circles uh, like that. And at the same time, and the bone and the kidney, they are the targets for or damage if there is a hyperparathyroidism. 
because they, they can cause this problem in the, in the kidney in, in the form of a formation of the stone because of high calcium, they cause the stone formation. Stone formation can lead to a uh, lot of problems due to uh, uh, kidney failure and all those things. So patient can land up in kidney damage leading to the secondary uh, renal failure. So, and the primary organ is in the, in the skeletal organ, there's a direct target, but there are indirect target also. I mean, well, the, the parathyroid also is called cardiotoxin. I think we are going to talk about uh, the hyperparathyroid and, and the heart. So, uh, there is a gentleman who was a nephrologist in the US. So, she was uh, very much, he coined this term, which is very much into uh, the relations PTH and heart, and uh, he used to uh, call it PTH is a cardiotoxin. I heard his lecture uh, in, um, in in a Japanese city in in, in Kyoto, uh, I think Kyoto. So he uh, the first time I heard uh, that uh, PTH is a cardiotoxin. So PTH has effect on so many other organs. So also vitamin D. You might have heard about vitamin D having role in uh, even cancer in the colon. It acts all over. Now even vitamin D, just like a screening calcium, now vitamin D is getting screened uh, for the community, for, for public health. And vitamin D is now getting supplemented in the diet. So there are very, very important things. That's why vitamin D is called a hormone. So now coming to the, uh, the, the, the little more complex of uh, the vitamin D, uh, the vitamin D also plays a role in suppressing the parathyroid hormone secretion. So that is the relationship we have to understand understand between the primary and secondary. So when the secondary uh, renal failure occurs, then the, uh, the renal failure occurs, the secondary effect on the parathyroid. So it's called secondary hyperparathyroidism. So primary is something uh, different and secondary is something different and there are another called tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So when secondary becomes autonomous, it becomes tertiary. So where is secondary hyperparathyroidism? is because of the renal failure. And the renal failure uh, fails to kind of uh, secrete uh, uh, the vitamin D, active vitamin D, because the active vitamin D is uh, product uh, in, in the kidney, renal tubules. So when the kidney fails, then active vitamin D is not formed there. So there is nobody to put a check on the, uh, in the parathyroids. So then they kept on secreting more and more and you'll find high PTH. Then, they, then it is behave like parathyroid hyperparathyroidism. So you'll find in secondary hyperparathyroidism, there will be bone loss, etc. But the cause is kidney. But in the primary, the cause in the parathyroid itself, that is like any other tumor, they're, they're autonomous. And in the tumor, you also must be going ahead and seeing about the adenoma that you're talking of. After some slides I mentioned about adenoma, there can be also hyperplasia. In the sense, all the four glands are affected. But in the adenoma, usually you get one adenoma in one gland. There can be multiple adenoma, but very extremely rare. So you have to understand primary hyperparathyroidism because there is a tumor or hyperplasia in the in, in the parathyroids. Secondary hyperparathyroidism because problem in the kidney. So that's why we got secondary effect on the parathyroid. There are other causes of problem in the hyperparathyroid due to the multiple endocrine neoplasia. Mm. That is again another terminology because genetic problems. So we can talk about that little later. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so just talk. one uh, thing I wanted to uh, mention here. So in relation to parathyroid hormone and vitamin D, as you rightly pointed out, vitamin D is a hormone, not just not a not a vitamin actually. So if I understand correctly, the in relation to parathyroid, the most important role that vitamin D plays is in the absorption of calcium. Am I right? Yes, sir. Right. Yes. So why I wanted to highlight this is. As you know, that a lot of people are, you know, recommended calcium supplementation, particularly women, because I was primarily an OBGY. And back in the days, we used to give quite a high dose of calcium. So what happens is if vitamin D is extremely low, which is very common in India, I think 95% uh, of people don't have adequate vitamin D if they're not supplementing. So supplementing with 
high dose calcium in the absence of normal optimal levels of vitamin D is not a great idea. Just wanted to mention that. And uh, Dr. Mishra, this is the, the parathyroid being a cardiotoxin. That is the first time I've heard that term, but it is true. This is something that we hadn't known a lot about before. So the relationship of uh, heart disease and stroke risk in uh, relation to the parathyroid hormones. A lot of people are not really aware of that, but I just want to highlight that because many, many of you are doing preventive, you know, health checkups and things like that. And I don't always see a parathyroid hormone in that list. So this is again, you know, parathyroid and vitamin D. This is so intimately related. And given that, you know, we talked about the uh, low uh, vitamin D3 levels in India. So one of the things that I do is when I check patients the first time, I usually do not check the parathyroid because I know they, if they have a low vitamin D, the parathyroid may be high and then like I am going on and testing everything else. So uh, Dr. Mishra, would you recommend that first we need to optimize vitamin D3 and then uh, focus on the high parathyroid or is it like we should look at all of it together? What, what is your opinion? A very nice question you have asked, actually, uh, because this is very relevant for uh, uh, relevant for developing countries. For Western countries, uh, they never thought about that there can be vitamin D deficiency, actually, because uh, most of the parathyroid articles are never mentioned. Uh, neither in any case of hyperparathyroidism, they used to investigate for vitamin D. Let me tell you, this knowledge has gone from us or countries oh, wow. like us. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll share you some of my our old papers. Uh, in fact, our uh, it's the second paper, the first paper again from India, second paper from us, where you have estimated vitamin D. That time the facility was not there estimating vitamin D here. So we used to collect some sample and we collaborated with a physician from Detroit and uh, Henry Ford Hospital. So he took the sample from here and we estimated there. This is the first paper published in one of the prestigious journal um, of uh, American Society of Bone Mineral Research. And gentleman is called Sudhakar Rao. Many people uh, in the medical field must be knowing him. Dr. Sudhakar Rao from Henry Ford. So we have a paper, commonly a common paper, way back about 20 years ago must be, where we first time showed that uh, the relationship of vitamin D with, with the parathyroid cell growth. Uh, that question came because our parathyroid tumors are bigger size when all these reports from Western countries were smaller size. They report in milligrams and we saw in grams. So, uh, so we tried to find out what is the reason. So your question is absolutely pertinent. You used to see so many cases of vitamin D deficiency, especially when you do this measurement in patients of parathyroid disease, primary hyperparathyroidism, number one. Number two, of course, this phenomenon is changing. In my paper that we have uh, uh, quoting now, in that paper we have seen three decades. In three decades, this, this trend has changed actually. That's because improve in the nutritional parameters or nutritional status of the population. So the vitamin D is more and more now normal when you detect them. It comes in 25, something like that. You know, Previously used to give seven, eight, 10, like that. Yeah. So, so this is changing. Our paper is based on that, the three decades thing. So vitamin D, uh, relationship with, with parathyroid is so important because it has the relationship not only on deciding on supplement uh, to the diet in developing countries, but in your country, also in Canada, also in the US, also all the countries where there is too much of winter. Why I'm telling so? So when this paper came, after that you'll find many papers coming up from the Western countries because when you have too much of cold for a long time, then, and, uh, and usually you get uh, parathyroid disease a little later in the, in the year, little low, fourth decade, something like that, fifth decade. So these people are not exposed to the sun. So that is a natural source of vit so the sunlight, is the source of vitamin D, right? And they're not exposed to the sun. And so they, they, when they tested uh, vitamin D, they found that deficiency in vitamin D in their patients of hyperparathyroidism. So vitamin D estimation is never part of the routine test in investigating for prime hyperparathyroidism in Western countries, when they found out this phenomenon there, they started doing that. Now, 
Point number two is why it is important to have vitamin D estimation. Because as you know, the low vitamin D can result in the hyperplasia of the upper thyroid, right? So now they'll secrete more hormone, increasing parathyroid hormone. So when you see the vitamin D is low, then so uh, the high parathyroid hormone obviously needs to be investigated further. I think there is a slide in letter as you go yes. along. So when you just find high pH doesn't mean that there will be always hyperparathyroid in their other cause. At least in our country, I have I have sent so many patients back to the physician when I suspect that uh, I think there is the element of uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency and when you do vitamin D estimation, you find very low. Now why that suspicion has occurred? This cannot be a primary HPT because other manifestation of the HPT, primary HPT, is not there. Mm -hmm. So it, I become suspicious on that. Then when you did vitamin D, it is low. So now it might be it, the same case, maybe a primary parathyroid, but not at that point of time, I should put a knife on that. So this person has given a supplement of vitamin D and we again estimated after six months. And we found the vitamin, the parathyroid hormone has come down. Mm -hmm. low. Of course, it is not in all cases, but a couple of cases yeah. we have observed that and and we have uh, deferred surgery in those <clears throat> patients. <clears throat> so just one one point, because in the interest of time, I'm going to, you know, cut short a lot of the things because vitamin D, low vitamin D is so common in India. So this reminds me of a patient in, you know, vitamin D supplements, people in India sometimes think that once they have taken, you know, for 12 weeks, that it will automatically remain high forever. So that is not true. You need a regular supplementation. So I had sent a, a patient, I remember, to an en, uh, endocrine surgeon because I assumed she was still on vitamin D and she had forgotten to take her vitamin D for a long time. So the next question is, who are the people we are going to screen for parathyroid hormones? So serum PTH. Number one, symptomatic. And I'm, I'll come to the symptoms. And as we mentioned about, you know, high risk for cardiovascular disease, heart disease, stroke, people who are taking lithium, so lithium is given as a psychiatric medication. So those, those people are at a higher risk for high parathyroid. Anyone who comes with a high serum calcium and kidney stones and radiation treatment to the neck. Now, why I highlighted kidney stones is because kidney stones are so common. So Dr. Mishra, would you say that every patient with a kidney stone at the first visit would need a parathyroid screening or should we only do it for recurrent kidney stones? Yeah, I think you answered this question. Uh, first is recurrent kidney stones mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, bilateral kidney stones. These two are very important. And uh, somebody has got a nephrocalcinosis <laughs> on both sides. So that those persons, first we first do a calcium. We mm -hmm. don't go stop. We do not go pitch estimation straight away. At mm -hmm. least in uh, our country, we first do uh, calcium, minimum three calcium and phosphorus and alkaline phosphatase. So mm -hmm. you find that derangement, then you go for PTSD. Yes, yes, I'll come to the lab testing a few slides down the line. Yeah, and yeah. also we are going to discuss a little bit more about the low vitamin D and what you should do when you find a low vitamin D and a high parathyroid. I'll, that is a slide little down the line. So uh, back in the days, Dr. Mishra, we were ta taught that stones, bones, groans, and psychic moans are like symptoms of hyperparathyroidism. So that would be mostly hypercalcemia, right? And Dr. Mishra, given your long experience in this, uh, is it true that, and you're going to talk about that in your paper, that you got more of these high symptoms during your earlier days versus now, as you mentioned, when people are screened a lot more? So how common is stones, bones, groans, and psychic moans now versus what it was maybe 20 years ago? I mean, I'll show you the couple of slides I had. So these symptoms are no more are very common symptoms. You get musculoskeletal problems mostly. Uh, and even you used to get very, very advanced disease uh, about 20 years ago. We get fractures in the skeletal systems, multiple fractures, bone tumors the uh, tumors we don't see those days nowadays actually so uh, yes. the trend is changing it's changing going towards your western countries where many people are <laughs> mild symptomatic or asymptomatic so we get mild symptomatics or moderate symptomatics i can say asymptomatic are very few okay so uh, dr mishra maybe i'm going to you know uh, challenge the thing of getting the asymptomatic ones maybe the asymptomatic ones come to people like me they don't go to you 
<laughs> so what are the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism as you can see in this list? Chronic fatigue, just don't feel well, difficulty concentrating, focusing, depression, anxiety, bone loss, insomnia. All of them. Sorry? All of them. All, yeah. all of them. Yes. And insomnia, irritability, brain fog, heartburn, kidney stones, chronic kidney disease, high blood pressure, cardiac arrhythmia, headaches, palpitations. Now, I just, as a, as a doctor treating women, I just want to mention something that in India, postmenopausal, perimenopausal women do not always have hot flashes because that is more common in Western countries versus in Asia, as you mentioned in your paper, and we're going to talk about that, musculoskeletal symptoms are a lot more. So often, I think, Dr. Mishra, women are told you're just getting old, you know, and this is why you have all these whole list of symptoms of pains and aches and this and that. But sometimes it is possible that we are missing a high parathyroid as well. So I just want everyone to understand what are the red flags that should come out when you are looking at a, a woman with all these symptoms, men as well, but I treat more women than men. So just wanted to mention that postmenopausal women in Asian countries have a lot of these symptoms, not so much of hot flashes. So if you're looking at a postmenopausal woman and you're thinking, she's not complaining of hot flashes, so it's not menopause. So it could be, the presentation could be very different. Then the next thing comes is diagnosis of pr primary hyperparathyroidism. So Dr. Mishra, as you mentioned, let us say many patients go through an executive health checkup or a yearly health checkup. And many people think that, you know, that can detect every possible disease on earth, which is not true. You and I know that. So what are some of the lab tests you would recommend? So number one thing, of course, symptoms. And the next, I have this list in two colors and I'll tell you why I have them in two colors. Now, given the fact that in countries like India, patients have to pay for all the testing from their pocket versus I'm in Alberta, I work with physicians here where patients don't have to pay for all the tests from their pocket. So how many of these tests would you say, which ones are the primary of primary importance and which could be probably you know, discretionary or maybe not for everyone if they have a problem of you know, spending a lot of money? Serum calcium. Okay. Phosphorus, alkaline mm -hmm. phosphatase, okay. and 125 vitamin D. And mm -hmm. we used to do not 125, we used to do vitamin D3, not yeah. 125. Yes, so that's what I'm asking, because 125 costs, I think, a lot more than D3. Yes, so D3 and, is enough for us. Yes, and is it necessary to do an ionic calcium, even if we find that serum calcium is normal and high parathyroid hormone is there? Yeah, I must say that actually when we do all these three tests, calcium, phosphorus, alpha, we also do serum protein. Because yes. serum protein, uh, especially albumin, you have to be very careful because uh, while calculating the, uh, the exact calcium measurements, it is, does, does help. Yes. Uh, because uh, low albumin can uh, give a wrong figure of calcium. And usually in a suspicion cases, we do three times this test. And without oh. putting a clamp uh, in the arm, and we do it in the fasting state. And of course, ionic calcium also do in, uh, again, in some selected cases. Again, you know, that is not available in all places. No. So whereas in yeah. serum calcium, we can do it. And let me tell you, if there is a mild symptomatic disease, even with ordinary calcium also it will be high. Mm. I still insist just calcium. If the calcium is raised, then you can check by doing repeat calcium, alphas, and also check it by the albumin that is enough, I think. And to take you uh, straight away to PTS instead of going to ionic calcium and all those things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. So I'm just uh, stating this again. In the ideal world, we would like to do all these tests, parathyroid, D3, proteins, calcium, alkaline phosphatase, and 125, ionic calcium, everything. But if all these are not possible, so at least uh, serum calcium, and if you have suspicions, then you need to repeat it. Of course, parathyroid and vitamin D3 are, uh, vitamin D3 is tested almost, I think every patient in India has a vitamin D3 test being done now. And a part of the executive health checkup or any of those checkups, serum calcium is usually done. Next thing comes, Dr. Mishra, uh, given that the parathyroid horm uh, glands are so small, what would, you know, what would really show whether there is a parathyroid adenoma? So an adenoma is a benign tumor of the parathyroid. 
would US ultrasound examination of the neck show it if it's very small? I'll just, uh, Dr. Kaur, I'll, one thing I forgot, I just want to mention it. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of screening for calcium, uh, for parathyroid, one thing is pancreatitis. You might have heard about pancreatitis. Yes. So one of the yes. causes for pancreatitis is also uh, hyperparathyroidism. Oh, that Pigeons. is very interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Thank so, you, Dr. Yes, you must. Because many cases we get from gastroenterologists, uh, maybe in a year, four or five cases, uh, they detect uh, hyperparathyroidism when they do a zero, routine serum calcium. And let me tell you, that can sometimes misguide you also because initially it may be low or normal, but later on it can be high. Uh, because when pancreatitis occurred, you might have heard from your MBBS knowledge is uh, saponification of the fat mm -hmm. there. Yes. So usually calcium is absorbed there uh, when tangled with these things. So actual calcium measurement will misguide you. But uh, if somebody has got the real hyperparathyroidism, really uh, causing high PTH, so definitely the calcium will be raised. So you pick up also calcium, uh, hyperparathyroidism for in case of pancreatitis. So once you, this is for information only. So your gastroenterologist uh, can pick up. Same thing with psychiatric, we have already discussed. Yes, so I'll come to that. The message, the message that I want to pass on to you and everybody is that uh, we have to suspect, yes. otherwise we'll miss. Yes. Otherwise miss. Please go ahead. So I fully agree with was, you, uh, Dr. Mishra. <laughs> yes, yes. So, in the yes. soul, you just discuss about the postman, but the women, you know, there also you have to suspect, you know, yes. you just cannot just pass it on. I, I must recommend at least all postpartum postman women, you must do a calcium and just don't pass it on. Uh, okay, you'll have aged or something like that, or yes. even having some rheumatic problem. No, please. In rheumatology clinic also, uh, I insist them, please get a calcium done. Uh, so you can also pick up some cases. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishra. That is something we have been talking about, but you know, a lot of people don't give that the due that is due to it. So yes, just I'll briefly go over imaging. Is it necessary to do a technician system EV scan for every patient where, with high no. thyroid? Okay. No, 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 no. So, so I, see, please remember one thing, uh, any endocrine uh, conditions, especially functioning endocrine uh, conditions, the biochemical test is very, very important. Okay. The biochemistry, biochemistry is the is the indicator uh, to localization. Why you do localization? Localization means if there is a tumor you suspect, you have to operate or take care of that. So ultrasound is not done for diagnosis. That thing one should know about it. So the primary hyperparathyroidism is diagnosed biochemically. Okay. So we need not do any of these imaging studies. And particularly when, you know, something like an MRI or a CT costs so much. And I think even the technician system EV scan costs a lot in India. So it is not wise to invest money in those testing because it's just going to, you know, make the patient spend a lot of money without getting adequate information. And ultrasound will not detect small tumors. Am I right, Dr. Mishra? Yes, you're right. Okay. Next is how important it is, is it to do a bone test? So I'm just going to explain the DEXA scan and the urinary antilopeptide. So DEXA scan is what everyone is familiar with. You go into a you know, machine, there is radiation exposure. And again, uh, the urinary antilopeptide, now why as functional medicine doctors, we like the U NTX is number one, it is non-invasive, no radiation exposure. And it's a simple urine test. And I know it's available in India as well. More importantly, it costs a whole lot less than a DEXA scan. So Dr. Mishra, my question to you is, is it enough to do an NTX and uh, know about bone health or is it necessary to do a DEXA scan? In the ideal world, yes. In countries like Canada, they have routine uh, DEXA scan every three to five years. But in a country like India, where patients have to pay for uh, their health care. Would you say that doing a NTX would be enough at least to get a sort of a baseline idea about bone health? Uh, I just want to answer this question in two parts. First, when you order a test, you expect some information from that test, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, clinical diagnosis was there 100 years ago, there's no test. You know, decade ago or two decades ago, three decades ago, what is standard normal has changed over now. Yes. So a lot of influence of industry and a lot of influence and the dependency uh, on uh, tests has uh, reduced our acumen for clinical uh, perception of any disease. Now, second part I want to discuss, that we should not 
chase the end point first find out what is my primary disease mm-hmm. if you're talking of dexa or um, or the tumor bone markers uh, like ntx those markers are impo- important whether it's radiological marker or biochemical markers that is only important to know whether the bone has been affected how much is affected mm-hmm. or if there is a tumor you want to reverse changes so you can compare preoperative dexa with the post op dexa so first my diagnosis is not achieved so mm-hmm. these two tests doesn't help in your diagnosis as i told repeat your diagnosis depends on your calcium and pts right yes. and to do pts you should have at least calcium calcium phosphorus and alphas or calcium so two or two times three times is all high the phosphorus may be normal doesn't matter if the calcium is high straight away or iron calcium is high straight away go for pts your diagnosis is made now you find out which are the four glands are affected either it is a single gland or multiple gland all those things require this imaging technique mm-hmm. and dexa is required that time also not to diagnose hyperparathyroidism just to find out how much the hyperparathyroid has done damage to the bone mm-hmm. that's so, the point thank you dr mishra so just a clarification uh, here we are talking about parathyroid so in relation to parathyroid uh, adenoma detection and hyperparathyroidism it is not necessary to do a dexa scan or a urinary ntx at the beginning of the workup however many patients go through a bone assessment for general health because in my world of preventive medicine bone health mobility is one of the major parameters for long term health so in relation to parathyroid if you are looking at only parathyroid you do not need to do a dexa scan or a urinary ntx right away it is much more important to rule out whether there is an adenoma in the parathyroid and refer to the patient the patient to the right person and we'll talk about that in a little while so just a little clarification now dr mishra in relation to parathyroid levels i think most labs in india consider 65 picogram per ml as the upper limit Now, do you agree with this paper where it says that this the upper limit of normal should be uh, different for people who are younger? I mean, uh, your your ears and your nose. So, what I mean to say is, what is this sacrosanct number sixty five? Any number? Yes. Do you think the sixty four is normal? Yeah. Sixty six is abnormal. I mean, it's not like that because you know, you have to standardize a particular test, right? Yes. So, if you take the standard deviation on each side, it can fluctuate to either side. and uh, definitely age has a role to play mm-hmm. but at the same time what i mean to say is the, the when the, you make a standard for an abnormal level of test so you do a random sampling of so many thousands of people then you make a standard but at the same time the parathyroid hormone keeps on increasing slowly slowly in in the subclinical level or sub optimal level so there are even in, uh, research done in some country i know they reduce the standard deviation for another by 5 same 60 So you will find there are a couple of cases they have observed after t- five years they develop uh, prank hyperparathyroidism. Some of them. Mm-hmm. So this level is definitely uh, important to see that otherwise you level everybody as uh, hyperparathyroid. So standard is sixty five and above is a uh, diagnostic of hyperparathyroidism. At the same time, if you find in a younger individual or older individual, then a little bit of here and there uh, you can wait. You can doubt. You can wait. Mm-hmm. no issue but uh, saying that uh, this uh, age has influence on the parathyroid hormone level i mean uh, is a research interest but in day to day practice we cannot make a, okay for old this is the level for young this is the level it's and not another like quick question dr mishra given that you know women and men are very different do you think the levels would be different for a woman I, I don't. Know, I've not seen any. Don't don't don't, discrim- don't don't discriminate sex 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 gender here. <laughs> I think you see. As far PTS is concerned, gender neutral. <laughs> <laughs> as far as we know, we don't know yet. <laughs> no, you are punishing. Let me tell you, you are punishing the women uh, uh, sex so much disease you are giving them. I mean, I really feel, feel pity about that. I think all the victims of disease are women. You know, talk of thyroid. At least my endocrine uh, diseases. Thyroid yes. is common in women. Parathyroid is common in women. So these two are more important diseases: endocrine, you know, <laughs> and there are so many other other diseases we are given more to the women. Now also a little bit of immune is there. Our cardiac system that is also now given equal oh, yes. uh, figures. That yes. is another area that I really love. So anyway, I mean, one of the things that I usually talk about is 
we were so used to, so back when I was an OBGY, we used to just tell women, you know, who are past their middle age, oh, you are just aging, you know, so just get used to it. Now things are very different. I, I Obviously, maybe I have grown older, but I'm not happy to feel unwell and achy and pain and, you know, brain fog and any of that. So obviously times have changed also. But my point is, it's very easy to tell a woman, you know, it's all in your head or don't worry, you're just becoming older. There are reasons for people to feel things. Anyway, moving on to calcium, Dr. Mishra, at this rate, we will continue talking for more than two hours. So calcium levels, again, uh, age factor, I think we'll just uh, ignore the age thing. Supposing a patient comes with, you know, mm, serum calcium levels about nine this year, Six months later, for some other reason, they've had a serum calcium done and it has reached 10. It has not gone beyond the, you know, the laboratory levels. Would that be significant? Someone like that, do, we, do you think we should check for the parathyroid and everything else as well? I think we know very well, uh, Dr. Carr is uh, uh, asymptomatic hyperparathyroidism, normal calcium hyperparathyroidism. So in this situation, you have to see the symptoms. How much, especially these kind of people have more musculoskeletal problems. Yes. So if they have, we should not ignore that symptom actually. We should, we should do alphas, same time, or repeat the calcium, and repeat ionic calcium. So these are the indications where mm -hmm. you should go for specific tests of ionic calcium. Though it costs more, I'll go for ionic calcium in this condition. And also see the protein and do a calculations and reach a particular figure. And the symptoms dictates my next action to level this case as normal calcium hyperparathyroidism, unless and uh, otherwise proven otherwise. Thank you, Dr. Misha. So this is just my, oh, my rant. So serum calcium levels are extremely tightly controlled. Now, why I'm saying that normal levels do not reflect bone health. So back in the days when I was an OBGY, we used to recommend calcium supplements to you know, all women. And sometimes I'd find women telling me, doctor, my blood calcium is normal. So I have normal bone health and why should I take calcium? So this is just my aside that I wanted to mention is for those of you, you're looking at your labs and you see a normal serum calcium that doesn't necessarily mean that your bones are okay. Bones are way more than vitamin D and calcium only. So for bone health, we'll have a different session. So next is, uh, Dr. Mishra, I call this the Indian problem of, you know, uh, the 60,000 international unit vitamin D3 capsule. And given that, you know, with the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, a lot of people are taking super, super high dose of vitamin D3 every day. So what happens is, again, just a little clarification, because the 60,000 international unit capsule is available over the counter in India, in countries like Canada, you won't get this without a prescription. What some, and I've had patients going through all of these. So some of them, what they ended up doing is taking 60,000 every day instead of once a week. And given the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, many people have started taking the 60,000 every day. And Dr. Mishra, you must have come across some patients who have done this in, in your practice. Yeah, but usually but I have not, I'm not seen. I'm not seen mm -hmm. somebody taking every day, uh, but uh, we, uh, we prescribe them when we found somebody hypovitamin hypo D, we, when we discharge the patient after parathyroid surgery, so we gave them one sachet. We don't have a capsule. We have a sachet. One sachet is containing 60,000 units. You give them every day for one week. Mm -hmm. Then after that, every week for six months, mm -hmm. right? Then once in a month. Even now also, I take once in a month. Mm -hmm. My vitamin D also low. So, yes. Uh, so I take once in a month. I'm going to interrupt you in the interest of time. So vitamin D, how to supplement vitamin D. We'll talk about that on another day because basically it depends on the baseline serum vitamin D3 levels. I have a blog post on this. I'll post a link on that. So what are the other causes of high serum calcium? We have already briefly mentioned. Diuretics and lithium are the big ones. So multiple myeloma, sarcoidosis, Paget's disease of the bone, these will not remain asymptomatic, but just uh, moving ahead. So this is a question which is, I think, very vital for primary care uh, providers is high serum calcium, low D3, high parathyroid. So what are we going to do? Uh, 
I think we will, I'll just move ahead to this slide. So uh, my question to you, Dr. Mishra is, someone comes with high parathyroid, normal serum calcium, low D3. We supplement with vitamin D3, depending on what their levels are, and retest after three months. So would you agree that the 30 nanogram per ml level is the level of vitamin D3 we need to uh, look at in patients in India as well? Because I, some of these numbers, I think, are from Western countries. So would we, should we look at 30 nanogram per ml as sort of the optimal level before we, we repeat a parathyroid test? Oh, we do that around, around 25, 30, that is, that is the range. Okay. So, so 25 yeah. also would be acceptable. Yeah, acceptable. So yes. I'm just stating this thing again. So you find a patient high parathyroid, normal serum calcium, low vitamin D. You give them vitamin D, let us say for three months, 60,000 once a week, uh, or you know whatever, 50,000 once a week, whatever it is that you're following. After three months, repeat the vitamin D3 test. If it has reached about 30, 25 to 30 nanogram per ml, and the uh, units are different, some of the labs report in uh, international units. International so, unit, yes. Yeah, so uh, nanogram multiplied by 2.49 is international units. When you find the vitamin D3 level has reached this kind of a level, then repeat the parathyroid because if again as we have discussed before if d3 is low parathyroid may be high and you're not going to get the right picture now the thing is if parathyroid is still high and serum calcium is normal and we have ruled out things like diuretics and lithium and all that how then what are we going to do next so that is where you know dr mishra's uh, you know knowledge comes so much in one thing I wanted to mention is we cannot, diuretics maybe we may be able to stop for a short time, but lithium is not easy to stop for many patients who are bipolar or any of those psychiatric conditions. This is just an aside, but if the patient is on lithium and you are just chasing the parathyroid, you may be chasing the wrong target. This is what I want to tell the audience. So the, I think one slide was there before that. So high parathyroid, normal calcium, this is something we're going to come to. So Dr. Mishra, would you suggest that any parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism after ruling out low vitamin D3, even if calcium is normal, we need to rule out a parathyroid adenoma? Yes, certainly, because uh, there is a condition called normal calcemic hyperparathyroid. Yes. Okay, yes. I'm going to move ahead. Uh, so the next thing is, you know, parathyroidectomy improves cardiovascular risk factors. So as we talked about earlier, high parathyroid, as Dr. Mishra said, it's a, it's a cardiotoxin. And I think back until a few years ago, we didn't have enough studies to tell us whether the surgery would improve their risk factors. But this, was a, this is a fairly new paper in 2019. So uh, Dr. Mishra, would you agree that uh, this is what you are seeing or you are waiting to do the study for that? I think it is well proven now mm -hmm. uh, that uh, even the so-called uh, uh, risk criteria of or consensus statement of yes. operating patients with uh, minimal symptoms or asymptomatic hyperparathyroid it has gone so many years of grilling now and the fourth round of consensus yes. is over. I think we are pretty clear now that is now proven, well proven. If you have got asymptomatic hyperparathyroidism, don't wait. I think this is definitely a risk factor on the, on the heart. And uh, let me just correct uh, uh, the, the terminology that uh, we just discussed about that. This cardiotoxin term was not introduced by me. It is introduced mm -hmm. by a gentleman called Dr. Slatopolsky. Yes. Slatopolsky, right? So he is a US based nephrologist. And I, I happen to attend. Uh, uh, international symposium on PTS, just yes. PTS. The international symposium held in Kyoto many, many years ago. So I was there. Uh, few surgeons uh, uh, among plenty of nephrologists and, uh, and uh, physicians and endocrinologists. So I heard the term there. In fact, I heard the term first time in my life that PTS is called cardiotoxin. Now it has been proven after so many years yes. so that it is definitely toxic, even if it is secondary hyperparathyroidism, CRS, chronic renal failure, if you have high PDS, you must take care of that. Yes. Thank you, no Dr. No, I, I, what I meant is you were the first person I heard talking about cardiotoxicity. Yes, definitely. 
thank you for acknowledging the person who came up with the term. Now, this is something very, very interesting because we have been in functional medicine world, we've been talking about parathyroid for a while, but a lot of other, you know, even fancy hospitals with, you know, executive health checkup don't even look at the parathyroid. So I, I know I'm not going to waste any more time in saying that there is a problem of underdiagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism. That is one message we want to give across to all of you. If you're not looking at parathyroid, serum, calcium, vitamin D3 together, this is the time to start doing it. So now I'm going to ha you know, hand over to Dr. Mishra to share his experience on uh, you know, parathyroid surgery and all the different, his, his experience is for many, many years. And if you're interested in knowing more about Dr. Mishra's research, you can go to ResearchGate. I think Dr. Mishra, all your research is on ResearchGate? Uh, most of them. Yes. Okay. So I have shortened this, the presentation a little bit from Dr. Mishra's wonderful longer presentation. So this is, this is the paper and this paper is available on ResearchGate if any of you would like to go ahead. And uh, so Dr. Mishra, over to you. Yeah, but what I just described a couple of minutes ago about uh, our two and a half years of experience, uh, we try to, uh, to to categorize in the three parts and three cohorts we uh, took up. But you have seen how this uh, disease has evolutionized in our uh, experience over the last 30 years here. So we took uh, these three figures. You can see here what we observed. This trend is interesting. This trend is increasing not because that the disease is increasing uh, in incidence. No, it is a detection. Mm -hmm. It is basically basically a detection of the disease because, as I told you, you have to suspect, then you have to treat, uh, then you have to diagnose, and investigate. So all these things are improved. When I started practice, there was no PTH estimation available, right? Mm -hmm. So we suspect only on the calcium and and and, uh, and the bone disease. You should get many many symptomatic disease. So calcium is enough calcium alphas and we operate. But nowadays we are getting even a very, very minimal symptom disease with uh, getting full diagnosis with all investigation available everywhere. And we have a system of for couriers, they send samples to some specific lab in big cities that get the reports. I, I must say that I used to always tell my fellows, so your life is so smooth nowadays compared to our time when we used to always poke our eyes into the skeleton and no skeletal survey is done nowadays. You know, mm -hmm. you can diagnose by biochemically. So that's one. And I go next slide. So the disease is increasing because of the detection, not by incidence. Okay. Uh, thank I'll you, Dr. Mishra. Slide. Just one question about the so AHPT is asymptomatic hyperparathyroidism. So typically, what would be a patient's history who is asymptomatic? So usually, is it the clinicians? You know, um, who are more astute, who would look at parathyroid even in the asymptomatic? Actually, the term, uh, let me tell you, the, if you are labeling 100% as asymptomatic hyperparathyroidism, if you really poke more deeply into yes. the symptoms, uh -huh. you'll definitely find there will be few who qualify for asymptomatic. Yes. Let yes. me tell you, in a very strict term, the asymptomatic will be the patients who are been routinely screened, like in seven, after 70s, 1970, you are getting routine screening in a routine health checkup every two years. When you find a person having high calcium, they repeat their calcium, and do PTS, then label that this is a case of asymptomatic hyperparathyroidism. Otherwise, if you ask them, they will have all vague symptoms, some uh, mental illness, something like that, as you just, just described. So it's very difficult to say actually uh, very strictly that one is asymptomatic. I must say that minimal symptom, that is a better terminology to be used, uh, minimal <laughs> symptom hyperparathyroidism. So let me just tell you, we should not be bothered about asymptomatic or minimal symptomatic. Somebody has a hyperparathyroidism or no hyperparathyroidism. That is more important. Thank you. So, Dr. Mishra, just one comment on so the average number of parathyroidectomy even until 2016 in your tertiary center is only 26.7. So, again, would you say that this is gross underdiagnosis? Yes, you are right. Underdiagnosis. So, I really, you know, how much I used to really feel desperate. Why in Western literature are getting so many cases? Why are getting so many less cases? Well, that happened because only to detect those conditions, they will not come tested to the surgeon. Yeah. But you are the people who you first diagnose it. You are looking at the primary level or somebody yeah. is an nephrologist or intermedicine people or people in the community hospitals. They have to pick up cases. So you need to educate them. Yes. Who are the person who should screen them? Yes. 
So this so is the reason I'm actually in slide. Yes. Sorry. Yes, 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 this yes. is the reason yeah. I'm bringing out these videos so that I want to people to you know be aware of what are the things they need to check. Now I highlighted that male is to female ratio because one is to 2.3. So whole lot more women in your in not just your cohorts, it's also worldwide, Dr. Dr. Mishra. Am I right? Yes, you are right. Yeah. And so given that, you know, the middle-aged women uh, so often complain of all these things and very often, as I said, you know, they are dismissed by being told it's, it's nothing really you need to worry about. Just one question, Dr. Mishra, this difference in age, 39 years yeah. in the first decade and 47 years in yeah, the first decade. What, yeah, what rightly caught this thing, yeah, rightly caught this thing. Yeah, why I'm telling you, this is a very important point you should know, actually. So uh, that time also used to uh, look at it. Why you are getting the early age? Why in Western figures are in the fourth decade and fifth decade? Yeah. Let me tell you frankly. If you see this trend here in three decades, so we are approaching to your standards. So more and more cases are now coming up in higher age group. And I'm sure in another 20 years, will exactly match uh, with, with Western uh, figures actually. And why in the young? Because all the symptom people used to get it in last 20 years are your symptomatic disease. Mm -hmm. So all symptomatic diseases uh, were missing all, all those minimal symptom diseases of elderly population. Yes. So only the symptomatic people come to us and so the age uh, difference is coming here. Yes, a lot of... I mean, this, are, this is a relative thing, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. A, relative. a lot of people were told, don't worry, it's nearly nothing very important. Now, this is a very interesting slide, Dr. Mishra. So musculoskeletal, as you've been saying, has been much more... The symptoms have been much more, uh, much higher in, the, in your cohorts urological gastrointestinal so urological would be mostly kidney stones yes they are kidney stones and gastrointestinal what were the commonest symptoms that uh, you this is our, so you have, as i told in pancreatitis mm -hmm. you know pancreatitis is one of the commonest things mm -hmm. so and that's the first thing yeah neck not dyspepsia this neck mass that is an interesting point yes because see we have published a paper where we found in the benign disease, usually you get neck mass in malignant parathyroid, mm -hmm. air condition, of course. So there you get pulpit, the glands actually. And in fact, it is written textbook. The, um, the diagnosis of parathyroid carcinoma is based on three factors. One is the neck mass, very high calcium. You know, th these are the things that we talk of the of carcinoma. Whereas in our conditions, in benign conditions also, we get neck mass, pulp palpable mass. Not like neck mass, big mass, big but you palpate, you'll find that. It's mm -hmm. that, that is very interesting. Uh, that is very but, but interesting. But if you see, the, uh, but if you see in the last part, you know, the the third part, you'll find yes. this neck mass incidence is coming down. Yeah, it's it's a lot yeah. less now. Yeah. So, so so I mean, same thing also. Same thing also. It's on the, you see the 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 muscular skeletal mm -hmm. used to have fractures, bone tumors. Yes. Those things are also coming down. Yeah. So neuropsychiatric, Dr. Dr. Mishra, I just want to you know, focus a little bit on that because mental health challenges have become so much more commoner now. And many of these ladies, they're just put on an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication without really focusing on the cause for this. So what were some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms that, you, that in your cohort you found? I think all these things that you just described, you know, okay. lack of concentrations, uh, not feeling well, not feeling energy to work, you know. So that, that is vague pain and ache and disturbing mind all the time. There's a sense of not feeling well. You know, it's very difficult to uh, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, unless you are a psychologist mm -hmm. or ordinary physicians, it's very difficult to understand actually. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is important for the psychologist, psychiatrist to pick up those cases there. Yes. So that is very, very important. So the so-called moans, groans and everything is still valid. Yes, but people have to people have to concentrate. But all these symptoms of moan groans become two three specialties. So mm -hmm. all these specialty people have to understand there is a condition called prime hyperparathyroidism. There is no harm in just ticking one calcium parameter. That's all. Yes. So there were some unique findings in your study. So what were the most the unique things that you found? So yeah, that's exactly I've made exactly the bullet points here. Most Indian patients are symptomatic. That is obviously everybody knows about it. Uh, recently, considerable decrease in the clinical and biochemical severity of the disease that you have observed. Mm -hmm. We don't get so many, so much high calcium. We don't get so much of high uh, PTH nowadays. This trend is coming down and it's coming almost towards like Western countries. Uh, 
-hmm. And the severe heart disease also has come down. You don't see much fractures nowadays. There is a time when you do a skeletal survey. Now it is not done at all. Only somebody has a fracture, which is very rare. Then the crisis, palpable neck mass, mm -hmm. pathological fractures, total now completely decreased. We hardly see any, any of them, very rarely. Then significantly lower mean PTS level, as I just described, mm -hmm. and alkaline phosphatase. They're all indications of high bone turnover, alkaline phosphatase. You don't see that much disease, unless you DEXA. With DEXA also many patients, we found they're normal, not mm -hmm. so low. But yeah. previously, each and every patient will have minus two or minus three, like that. Even. Mm -hmm. Now it is almost uh, gone, of course. Okay. So the next question, Dr. Mishra, is when should a primary care practitioner refer a patient to an endocrine surgeon? That is my number one question. Number two question is, given that there are so few endocrine surgeons and you have a virtual consulting with, at your institute, is it possible for a patient from a remote place in India where they don't have an uh, endocrine surgeon to access services of anyone online? Before endocrine surgeon, uh, if you are talking of primary care, mm -hmm. they should send the patient to an endocrinologist first. Mm -hmm. okay. That should be my approach, actually. Unless uh, you have investigated and you have found that high PTH and high calcium, all those criteria there are fulfilling. Mm -hmm. uh, then you can send directly to an endocrine surgeon. It depends on your health system, how it is done, actually. Because okay. uh, you may find maybe in 99% cases, you are already right in you know, your diagnosis of parathyroidism. But there will be some odd cases, you know, where lithium and all the things are there, giving you a wrong figure of high PTH so, or vitamin D deficiency. Mm -hmm. So better to send it to some endocrinologist first, then they will send to endocrinologist. Unless you are very much uh, sure about sure. the diagnosis. So, Dr. Mishra, I think we have kind of answered this question. So, when it is symptomatic, I'm just reiterating the symptoms once again, because a lot of these symptoms are non-specific. Chronic fatigue, just don't feel well. These are also symptoms of things like, you know, uh, low iron and iron deficiency anemia is so common. So, I'm just reiterating the same slide that we had discussed before and as you said, there are no asymptomatic patients. It's usually that either they've not been screened well or they have minimal symptoms. So all these patients, people with something like high blood pressure, Dr. Mishra, high blood pressure is so common in India and I'm not sure how many of them have actually been screened for parathyroid. So again, this is from one of the guidelines that I came across and I my, this is my personal opinion. This is a little elitist for a country like India. Would you say that? Would you think that, would you say that there are, we can do with less in India because of the you know, conditions of where people have to pay for everything? I don't think it's possible uh, to yes. <laughs> go for, no, it's not possible. I mean, those guidelines uh, I've been following for last four occasions, they've done the four guidelines has come up now. So you'll, I was looking at this thing, even the fourth consensus development, these all matches to our indications. So mm -hmm. ultimately they have come down now, it's for the same condition they used to say that wait mm -hmm. and follow up. They themselves are saying, even if you all your visits are sponsored by your insurer and mm -hmm. the total uh, care taken care by the insurance, still you are feeling your burden is so much and they, you say they're better to go operate rather than watch. And the physician himself or herself prefer to uh, report to patients to the surgeons rather than keeping in, in the clinic and follow up. Because who is going to take the risk? Yes. Now somebody asks you that why I'm getting a heart attack because you did not advise me for surgery. I would have been better now. Yes. So nobody is going to take a risk now. It is uh, so the fourth consensus statement now coming up. It's very, very clear nowadays whom to operate and whom to not operate. So mm -hmm. for the so-called asthmatic hyperparathyroidism, when the first consensus statement was developed, is totally now different in the fourth consensus statement. Okay. More and more cases, broadly speaking, one liner, more and more cases are going for surgery. Patients are asking for surgery. That is very gratifying to know. So, Dr. Mishra, as I had asked, is it possible for patients to access virtual care to endocrine surgeons? Is there a website where uh, this information is available? So, I will prefer not, uh, yeah, of course, there are many websites available for information to the patient. Mm -hmm. It's better to identify a person or an endocrine surgeon uh, and take a one-to-one -one consultation rather than putting blindly in a website asking for opinion. I mean, uh, okay. that may not be a, a better option, actually. Mm -hmm. And find out even overseas also. Though, though, for example, we have no license to practice in Canada. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one can take a second opinion. 
mm-hmm. from somebody and uh, and uh, reach at some diagnosis kind of thing but uh, what i mean to say is virtual consultation is possible but not in the way that you are asking putting in the website and getting the answer it is uh, better to sorry find, no find Dr. Out Dr. Sha, i i didn't mean putting on a website i meant is there a list of all the endocrine surgeons in india somewhere where you know patients can look if anyone is there nearby yeah yeah i mean see the you see the publication the best way is to go to publications oh okay so publication so that is again i think that the way we do in india is usually ask our friends and colleagues you know do you know an endocrine surgeon and we refer to <laughs> i mean uh, i mean everybody is endocrine surgeon every every head and neck surgeon is endocrine surgeon nobody will see that they are not <laughs> so i mean the way you define in canada or in us is different in india mm-hmm. thank you dr yeah. mishra and what you said rightly about the guidelines is so important because a few years ago i have had frustrating experiences when i send my hypoparathyroidism patients to endocrine surgeons they come back and said no the doctor said i don't need surgery now you know i said no you need another opinion i think yeah so, yes and uh, i am just going to summarize what we talked about so when to screen so dr mishra i will s- say that everyone needs to be screened will you agree to that i'll little modify that it depends on the age of the patient and uh, the symptoms that you have in a primary care setting and in second care setting when the patient is having like pancreatitis or some kind of uh, rheumatic problems or patients having this uh, uh, coming to the clinics of psych- psychiatrist so if they are going there what in primary care is very important where uh, those big uh, routine uh, checks like uh, witness etc like a concentration that is the main point to at least screen calcium should be a screening test for that actually mm-hmm. uh, and you can pick up those cases right and i think one more thing i'll stress upon is uh, recurrent kidney stones is another big one Sure, sure. That is so common, and a lot of people yes. don't look at that. And we talked about yeah. D three deficiency and high parathyroid, and how to deal with a patient uh, who has that condition. Then we talked about how to ref- when to refer to an endocrine surgeon, and so when do patients benefit from surgery? So, uh, Doctor Mishra, back in the days in my fellowship, we were taught that you know many patients with hyperparathyroidism because of an adenoma do not realize how unwell they were so after the surgery many of them have said i didn't know how unwell i was now i'm feeling so much better is is that does that reflect your experience as well actually i was going to tell the same thing what you have just spoken actually <laughs> so you'll find this the, the patients will completely be different after surgery in the day one itself you know mm. in the day one itself i have seen the patients uh, feel so better they say that i am feeling very well they can describe yes we are just feeling well that's all you know unless somebody has a uh, bone pain yeah the, the bone pain is the first thing that recover in the day one wow so when i go to the ward after surgery i ask the patient uh, how do you feel i feel little less uh, ache now mm-hmm. so what the last thing that is going to come up is a psych- psychological condition that take little more time Uh, like concentration if that takes more time but the bone pain uh, muscle weakness etc recover very fast actually uh, blood pressure reversal is very very doubtful condition because you know in the heart when there is changes in the blood pressure yes. they they may they may reduce or they may not increase but mm-hmm. coming to normal will be unlikely because you know there are changes in the peripheral vessels and all this thing when muscular disease occur or there's a calcium deposit in the peripheral vessels mm-hmm. but uh, the bone pains uh, the muscle weaknesses uh, the psychological conditions they just as you said they just said doctor i cannot tell you how i'm feeling it so that uh-huh. kind of thing thank you dr mishra this was fantastic just one question this is for uh, just an intellectual curiosity it's not really relevant to patient this thing so cardiovascular disease and parathyroid now back in the days we used to think that it was because of the high calcium and how calcium can get deposited in the blood vessels but given that there are normal calcemic uh, hyperparathyroidism with higher risk for cardiovascular disease how do we explain this relationship between the heart and the parathyroid do we know yet or is it still under investigation i mean uh, i mean you don't really investigate so much about uh, this condition now people are investigating now got sophisticated eco cardiography mm-hmm. machines they can uh, um, uh, investigate a lot of things one of my colleague is also involved in the research in that aspect uh, in uh, st- studying the myocardial uh, 
changes that occur in hyperparathyroidism. People have done a lot of studies on that also. What are changes occur in myocardium? So uh, there are some changes in enzymes and all these things is still a matter of investigation. But one thing I must say that in normal calcium hyperparathyroidism, you don't expect the vessel changes much. Mm -hmm. The vessel changes because, because of the resistance. Once there is hypertension, there is resistance, peripheral mm -hmm. resistance. Or once there is hypertension, there are some physiological changes on the heart. That sometimes leads to little hypertrophy of the heart. So those things doesn't come back so soon. That's the point I want to tell you. Okay, thank you. One last question. So Dr. Mishra, if you had all the funding in the world, all the support from everyone, what is the one study you would like to do on parathyroid? I'll just do one study in parathyroid to find out that how quickly you can detect this, this parathyroid. Okay. Because as you delay, uh, the, this, there's going to be more problems. So how to really pick up the cases? Uh, so I'll let go for a population based study. Uh, not very sophisticated lab study or not going because the only thing that decides is just to take a calcium mm -hmm. so i need to to and not to educate people i want to invest a lot of money to educate the primary care physician yes so no no sophistication is required to to know the changes of that hyperparathyroid causes in the body no amount of laboratory research i just want to educate primary care physicians i wish to just see that how rapidly we can diagnose these, these conditions because these are very gratifying uh, result of surgery in hyperparathyroidism. You can really have seen patients that the patients develop kidney failure because long-standing hyperparathyroidism not being operated for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Young age, we have lost patients yes. because of kidney Thank failure. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishra. This has been really wonderful. And we are going to, yes, we will definitely, we will try to educate more primary care doctors, internal medicine specialists and all. So usually specialists are sort of aware. It's more the, you know, the community doctors who sometimes don't have time to, you know, keep up with all the research that comes out. Thank you very much, Dr. Mishra, and bye now.